of debate. My name is Alan Foles, and I'll be moderating the discussion. I'm joined by a press panel to ask the questions. On my far right is Joy Richard of Gatehouse Media, representing the Burlington Union and the Bedford Minuteman. Seated next to Joy is Rich Hosford, B News Director here at BCAT. At this session, we'll be focusing on the state representative race for the Middlesex uh, 21st District, which covers Burlington, Bedford, as well as Precinct 3 in Wilmington. We have two candidates for the position. On my far left is Ken Gordon, the incumbent and Democratic candidate. On my near left is the Republican challenger, Paul Girard. By the way, both are familiar faces here at BCAT. They both produce TV shows. Uh, Ken produces Rappin' with the Rep, and Paul produces Burlington Roundtable. They were both award winners at this year's BCAT Appreciation Night. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Here's how we'll proceed. Each candidate will begin by offering a one-minute opening statement. We drew lots earlier to decide who goes first. After that, our press panel will ask questions of the candidates. Every question will go to both candidates. Each candidate has 90 seconds to answer. We'll alternate between the members of the press panel asking the question, and we'll also alternate between the first responses. If the questioner has any follow-ups, we'll allow that as well. Next, each candidate is allowed to ask one question of the other candidate with 90 seconds to respond. We have 90 seconds for all of these answers. Finally, each candidate will give a two-minute closing statement. If candidates want to rebut something that's come up during the debate, that's their chance to do it. In the interest of covering as many topics as possible, I'll keep a close watch on the time, so make sure you frame your responses accordingly. All right, if everyone's all set, we'll get started. We'll begin with uh, Mr. Gordon. Ken, your opening statement. Thank you very much, Alan, and thank you for the plugs on our cable shows. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, BCAT, for organizing this, and thank you all for tuning in. It's been my honor to represent Burlington, Bedford, and Precinct 3 in Wilmington for the last four years. I've made a promise to you that I would listen to you, I would uh, respond to your concerns, and I've done just that. In the last few years, you've told me that your biggest frustration is the traffic that plagues our roads. I brought uh, engineers from the Department of Transportation into Burlington. They heard you directly. They saw the issues directly. And as a result of that, work is going on right now to create a dedicated lane off of Route 128 uh, into Burlington. That will keep highway traffic on the highway, which will relieve traffic on our town roads. I was able to work with a business group to bring a series of shuttle buses into Burlington from Lowell and Cambridge so that we could fill our job openings without bringing too much traffic. I brought state uh, leaders to Burlington to help address issues involving our students, our seniors, and our veterans. That's why nine of the 10 elected uh, selectmen and school committee members here in Burlington have endorsed my campaign for re-election. But there's more to do, and I ask for your vote on November 8th, and with that, we can continue to do this good work. Thank you very much, and now Mr. Gerard. Thank you, Alan, thank you, Rich and Joy, and thank you to BCAT for hosting this event. My name is Paul Gerard, and I'm the Republican candidate for state representative here in Burlington, Bedford, and Precinct 3 in Wilmington. I was raised here in Burlington and also raised my family here, and um, it's a great place to live and to work. I've also, my professional career has been here in Burlington as an IT professional, as an IT specialist and lab manager and system administrator. I've worked in and around the er area for about 30 years. and. Uh, you know, it's a great place to live and work. I've worked for both local and, and global companies, and I've had many, many visitors come over the years to our area, and they just love it here. We have a great thing, and we want to keep improving that and working on that, and, um, you know, I think I can do a great job as a state representative doing that. My uh, experience is I'm an elected town meeting member in Burlington and also chairman of the Burlington Republican Town Committee. Um, so... Set? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, questions from the press. We'll begin with Rich Hosford, and the first question will go to Mr. Gordon. All right. Um, if reelected, uh, what's a piece of legislation or an issue that you'd like to tackle right in the first session? Well, we, the issue that I will continue to address is transportation and traffic. We have a good start. 
as I said in my opening statement. We were able to get MassDOT to commit federal dollars, $800,000, to uh, reorganize the exit at Route 128 and Route 3 so that we have a dedicated line into Burlington so that we no longer have to wait on Route 3 north traffic. And that's going to help our town roads because people with GPS uh, will not be will stay on the highway rather than use our town roads. But there's more to do because there's more traffic that that uh, plagues our roads. There's Route 3A. Uh, uh, the, the traffic is here. So what we've got to do is continue to work on systems of transportation that will um, provide for multi-passenger vehicles. That would be a public private partnership and I've been working with the Middlesex 3 coalition very closely so that we can get our workers into Burlington um, on these vehicles you know we have a hundred thousand uh, workers who come into Burlington who don't live here every day if we uh, if, if they bring in each worker one car we can't handle that amount of traffic so I want to continue to work on programs that will bring transportation access to the businesses of our town and also allow our residents to use that transportation so our seniors can have access to transportation that they can, uh, that currently they don't have. Thank you. Mr. Gerard, the same question? Um, as I've talked to voters, a lot of, I see a lot of um, people taking care of elderly parents, so I'd love to see some sort of legislation that would allow a tax credit for people to stay home and take care of elderly parents and make it more affordable for them to do so. You know, many of them are homebound and it would be great to provide some sort of incentive so that they can actually stay home and take care of their, their uh, aging parents. Thank you very much. Next question comes from Joy Richard, and this one will be directed at Paul to start with. Hi. Um, I'd like you to name three of the issues that you've heard repeatedly from residents during your campaign that are the most important to them. I would say the number one issue I hear from voters is managing growth. Uh, you have a lot of older residents in Burlington who remember how it was and you've been here since the 50s and 60s and they're concerned about the growth we have and just the best way to manage that. How do we strike a balance between you know, a lot of the uh, maintaining the residential areas as opposed to some of the areas that are getting built out. So I'd say that's the number one concern. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say number two probably that I hear from voters is um, the tax burden on small businesses. You know, a lot of the uncertainty with regulations and so forth, and a lot of small businesses would like a more business-friendly climate in Massachusetts where they can count on things and, you know, they don't get hit with these taxes that are not fully studied or there's, so th that's a big concern for, for a lot of small businesses. And I guess thirdly would be, um, you know, the opioid crisis that's going on. Uh, this ju it's just a, such a, a huge problem. and. Um, you know, I know, for instance, Representative Gordon voted against the um, minimum sentencing for trafficking or possession of fentanyl, which is a powerful opioid, so I don't know why that would be the case, but at any rate, um, it's a serious problem, and I know the governor's been tackling it, and I look forward to working with the governor on it. Thank you. Thank well, you. Yeah. Thank you. The top three issues that constituents talk to me about are transportation, education, and senior housing. Before I start the answer, to answer that in more detail, let me just explain the, um, the issue with mandatory minimum sentences. We're going to be taking up that issue uh, later in time, but uh, that's a much different issue than the comprehensive bill that we did pass. And we did a lot of work together with uh, Governor Baker, the Republican governor, in a bipartisan way to control um, and provide education uh, on the very uh, important opiate crisis. I do agree with with Paul that it's it's an urgent crisis that we must deal with here in Massachusetts but that particular amendment that he's talking about had nothing to do with the substance of the bill which I voted for now transportation I've been describing that is I think the number one issue we have 3.1 percent unemployment in Burlington we have uh, uh, a tremendously vibrant economy um, our economic development is doing quite well but we've got to manage our economic development because we're a victim of our own success when it comes to traffic as I said we're bringing in a hundred thousand people every day and we've got to control how we do that so as I said before allowing the uh, or, or providing some support for our businesses to bring their employees in through shuttles is helpful to the business it's helpful to the employees and it's helpful to our residents so I was able to get an appropriation of $142,000 through the economic development bill to bring workers for our restaurant industry, which is crucial to Burlington, uh, from uh, Lowell into Burlington and into Bedford. I'm hoping that that seed money that will grow, it will show some success. Number two is education. Whenever a business opens, 
education, uh, our, our educated workforce is vital to the economic development of our region. And I've been working, uh, and, I, and I hosted a forum helping seniors to find a place to go once they find that they no longer want to live in the large house where they raise their family so that there's a smaller place for them to go and then their home is then available to sell for a family with school-aged children to come in and use the wonderful schools that we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next question for Mr. Hosford and this will go to Ken. All right, I want to ask something about one of the ballot questions. Uh, one, of, one of the questions on the ballot is to legalize the recreational use of marijuana for people over 21 years of, of age. Uh, what are your thoughts? Are you for or against it? And what, if it does pass, what would you like to see the state do to make sure that it's used safely and used only by adults? Well, I'm firmly against question four. I think it should not pass. Um, the reason is ballot questions in, in general are different than legislation. Legislation um, comes about after a series of hearings. And um, we hear from both sides and we tailor a bill that addresses as much as we can. Ballot questions are written by advocates and in this case the ballot question was written by advocates who are trying to push a, um, a retail form of marijuana into Massachusetts. They've been successful in the western part of the state. They think they can get a toehold here. This is different than the kind of marijuana that we saw in the 80s or the 70s and a lot of people I think look at that and they say well you know I saw that in college. This is different. The PCP level of the type of marijuana that was ex in existence in our area in the in the 70s had about 3% PCP. It's much more now. It's much it's much stronger. There's no regulation within the ballot question that controls what the PCP levels would be. There's nothing in the ballot question that would control, for example, if someone is pulled over uh, for um, uh, driving under the influence of, of marijuana, what would you do because there's no breathalyzer? Now there was a, a letter that was circulated. I didn't sign it because I don't sign advocates' letters. I don't sign other people's words. I didn't think that letter went far enough, frankly, because I think this is a very important issue. They weren't my words, but I've been quoted in the press as saying that I'm firmly against question four. I don't think the way it's written is good for Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Same question, Paul. I am firmly against question four. I, I will definitely be voting against it. Um, you need to no, look no further than Colorado to see the devastating effects of legalizing marijuana there. When you look at the, uh, the major component is the edibles, which are just a horrible thing to have candies and cookies and sodas uh, laced with THC. So it's, um, you know, you, there are now more pot shops than Starbucks and McDonald's in Colorado. It's a, it's a horrible thing, devastating effect on our youth it's certainly a gateway drug, and there is absolutely no upside to it. The ballot question was written by the marijuana industry, and I certainly hope that voters will educate themselves and that this question will not pass. Thank you both. Thank you. Next question comes from Ms. Richard, and it goes to Paul Gerard. Okay. Um, so, taking a look at national issues, what do you feel um, is one national issue that's most relevant to the voters in Burlington in particular? I would, I would say national security. Um, you know, we have issues with um, people coming into our country. You know, the people are uncertain about the vetting process, how people are coming in. I, I hear rumors of, of Syrians coming in through Hanscom from various sources, and I don't, haven't been able to substantiate it, but um, I think that national security is a big issue for people. All it takes is one person who's not vetted properly to get in here, and, um, you know, it, it causes devastating effects as we've, we've seen in the past. But I would say that's a major concern from people I've talked to is just the sense of the sense the, the feeling they have that um, you know our borders are not protected and we don't know who's coming into our country. Mm -hmm. okay. Same question, Ken Gordon. Thank you. I think the biggest national issue that affects our lives here in Burlington is the opiate crisis. Um, it affects us here in the state. It affects us here in the town. Uh, since 19, since 2005, the number of people who have uh, died from overdoses of, of uh, opiates have just exploded. The reason that we're in this situation is a, re is a matter of education. These painkillers have been prescribed for short-term pain for years without any warning whatsoever. So a child can, a high school athlete for example, can suffer an injury, can go to the hospital, come out with a packet of 10 or 12 opiates to treat short-term pain without any warning whatsoever that that poor student, that poor son or daughter of, of the parent 
is now going to have a very tough time getting off of those opiates. The parents aren't warned, the, the students aren't warned. Governor Baker and the legislature have worked very closely on a program. We passed legislation in the last session. What it does and what he calls it is remove the stigma. And it's important to remove the stigma because if we consider opiate abuse to be a criminal act, then people are going to run to their corner and they're going to be afraid to come forward. If we, cons if we consider it to be a, 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 um, an act of, of, of uh, substance, and an act of, of mental illness because people are now have now become addicted then we can tr they, we can treat people and people will come forward they'll go get treatment for the condition so we've got to treat it with education so people know not to take these things uh, chronic pain is different but short-term pain they don't need these things and we've got to allow people to come forward and say my son my daughter is addicted to this please help them without worrying that they're going to end up in a criminal system mm -hmm. thank you Thank you very much. Next question is Rich Austin from B News. Well, you look like you had more to say about that issue, which is good because that was actually my next question: is what more can the state do uh, to fit, you know, to help uh, combat the opioid epidemic? Unfortunately, you, you know me too well because <laughs> I almost always have more to say. Sure. And yes, I, I do because. So going back, we've got to treat this as a uh, uh, as a health issue and not as a criminal issue. So we've begun the process, and we can always do more. We can always do better. But what we can do is go into our schools and educate the kids. If you get the students, I should say, if you're in the situation where you know you've got a short-term pain condition, don't turn to these um, these these medicines. Um, understand the, the understand what you're getting involved with. Educate the physicians. Understand. The Attorney General worked with CVS, and, and I believe that you can turn these medicines back into Walgreens. But, so the pharmacies are beginning to understand that we've got to solve the problem and not just talk about it. Um, addressing this intervention, as I said, so that parents can bring their, their uh, children into the hospital without fear. And that's very important. And again, the lack, it's, not, it's not punitive, it's treatment. And that's what we've got to do. So we've got to um, increase, uh, we've got to increase funding as we have for this treatment because again you know in this case it's it's a penny saved is certainly a dollar earned because we're talking about kids lives we're talking about people's lives it's out of control and we've got to slow it down thank you thank you paul same question well there's certainly a lot more we can do i think governor baker's made a great start by um, some of the changes he's made including limiting the amount of prescription you can get so that's a great start and obviously you know some somebody gets an injury um, you know we have to make sure that they are not taking more than they can or have. So these are the type of things. And also we want to make sure that obviously, you know, gateway drugs and things like that are not, not accessible. Uh, hopefully this question four will be, not be passed. Um, there's certainly a lot to be done. I, I really look forward to working with the governor on this. And um, there's, there's a lot more we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Next question will come from Joy Richard of the, the Union and the Miniman. Mm -hmm. Joy. Okay. Um, in our polarized political climate, how would you or uh, have you um, integrated bipartisan politics into how you operate? This goes to Paul. That's a great or question. How would you, then? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny. A, a state rep race is not necessarily that partisan of a race. I've talked to so many people who, um, you know, the, the party doesn't even come up, that we talk about issues. So a lot of people agree with me on the issues. They, they agree that, that Beacon Hill is not listening. They agree that there's so little transparency there and accountability. They, they're looking for somebody who who's agrees with them on the issues, not necessarily the party. And even many Democrats agree with me that you know, the one-party system on Beacon Hill is not benefiting anybody. You know, we have a, a Speaker of the House now. His, his term limits have been removed, thanks partially to Representative Gordon, who voted to remove his term limits. And we have a lopsided system where, where there's very little accountability, where one party calls the shots on most of the things. The governor's trying to do what he can to hold the line on taxes. Speaker DeLeo just announced that you know, there could be more need for revenue coming up. So you know, we could be having more tax, you know, tax coming up. And uh, this is the type of thing where, where I talk to voters and, and they're, they're kind of sick of all the politics. They want somebody who's actually going to represent them, who will, who will stand up for them will have their back and, and, and I look forward to working with the governor. I know that um, I would be one of only about 30 some odd Republicans so I would have the governor's ear for sure and I, I look forward to working with the governor uh, going forward and I certainly have his, his endorsement and um, okay. that's basically. 
Great, thank you. Thank you, well, same question, Ken. Yeah, and it's interesting, listening to uh, Mr. Gerard's answer, he started off by saying that a state rep race is not a matter of politics, and then the rest of his answer was describing how this state rep race, to him, is a matter of politics, talking about how many D's and R's there are on the hill. Well, this isn't a matter of politics to me. You know what it is? It's a matter of doing a good job for Burlington. Because when I go to work, whether it's on Beacon Hill or here in the district, I put Burlington first, and I put Bedford and, Pre and Precinct 3 and Wilmington first. And so what I've done is, for example, on, on bills that I filed calling for, for example, paid family and medical leave, or bills that I'm interested in pursuing, I've called the Chamber of Commerce, and I've, gotten, I've asked them to get their members together so that I could get input. Uh, from them about that. I know they were concerned in two years ago when we talked about the minimum wage, so I convened a meeting there, a forum there, and anyone could ask me any question, and I invited everyone to do that in a bipartisan, productive way, not talking about a party or another. One very important issue here in, in this district is our, is our care for veterans. The governor is very concerned about that, as he should be, as am I. We have Hanscom uh, Air Force Base here in our district, and it's responsible for $8.5 billion a year into our economy. That stretches well beyond Bedford. That stretches into Burlington, because many of the people commissioned there come out here and they rent or buy property and shop here. The governor appointed me to the, interstate Mass the Massachusetts Interstate uh, Com Compact Commission for the education of children of military uh, families, because that's an important issue to me. I'm focused on the kids that are in the high school in Bedford, but I'm also focused on military children all over the state. I'm working with Governor Baker, I'm wor working with Francisco Urena, the Secretary of Veteran Services, uh, Jim Pizer, and the Secretary of Education, and together we can make life better for these veterans. So it's not a matter of politics. It's not, it, we, we work very well together. Sometimes people Jane, look at Washington. Up in about 10 seconds? Sure. People look at Washington and they see the divide. It really doesn't exist in, to that extent for me in Beacon Hill because I can work w well and have worked well across the aisle. Thank you. Great. Next question from Rich Hosford, and this will be directed at Ken Gordon. Okay. All right, it's kind of a two-part question. One is the, your thoughts back to the ballot on the uh, charter school debate that's going on that would allow uh, additional charter schools to be uh, opened up in the state. And just in general, what would you do to uh, help support education locally? Sure. Again, a ballot question is a matter of dire direct democracy. <coughs> and again, ballot questions are written by advocates, and then the voters are, in a sense, there to go up or down. So on this ballot question, I would vote no. Uh, that's my personal vote. I don't support the question the way it's written. And I don't support the expansion of charter schools unless there's a real need for it. Um, the issue would be that we would be increasing the number of charter schools by 12 each year. Now let's talk about charter schools. What they are is they're public schools that are operated and run by the state. They're not operated and run by the school district of the town where they are. So if, if Burlington, for example, wanted to open a charter school, what would happen is we would have a public school in Burlington that the school committee wouldn't run. And I don't think that the residents of Burlington want to have a public school here that their elected officials don't have input into. The state would run it. Secondly, what would happen is the funding for the students would go from, for example, Burlington High School to this other school. That has an effect on Burlington High School. So I don't think that's the best way for us to run a public school. Now, there are some charter schools that are a little different. They offer a different program that's unavailable, and they're more akin to a regional technical school. That's different. Shawshine Tech is in a different category because it's a different program. This would replicate the, the type of school that the student was coming from. The theory is they just do a better job, okay? So what I think we should do is use our tax money to do a better job for everybody. And what I would tell the parent of the charter school on a wait list is, let's use our money, put it onto the schools that everybody can go to, not just those lucky enough to win a lottery. Let's put our money back into the general public education and make all our schools better and make opportunity available to all students, not just those lucky enough to be in a school because they won the lottery. Thank you. Thank you. Same question, Mr. Gerard. I do support charter schools. I think the expansion of charter schools can be beneficial. Um, it's mainly in more of an inner city issue than it is for here in Burlington or in our district. Um, there are over 30,000 kids on waiting lists trying to get, get out of failed schools and I think it can be very beneficial for those, those kids. And I think also that the competition of these charter schools will force the, the public failings, the schools they're in that are failing to improve. And you know they, they've, they have had years to improve and they appear to not be improving so I think this is good incentive and good competition to cause them to improve and force them to improve. So I do support expanding charter schools. And as far as um, improving education overall, I would say 
I would like to see Massachusetts reject Common Core and stick with the NCAS system. I don't think Common Core is, is good for Massachusetts schools. Thank you. Thank you. We now move into the third uh, phase where each of you get to question your opponent. We'll start with Mr. Gerard and Mr. Gordon, you'll have 90 seconds to answer. Paul. Yes, Ken, can you list for the voters all the tax increases you've voted for over the last four years? That's an interesting question, but I didn't really bring an index of all the legislation that came across my desk uh, in the last four years, so I'll tell you what I did. Uh, when well, I that's, started, that's I will tell you. The question. Excuse me, I'll, I'll answer it. When I started in the legislature, I uh, was confronted by a crisis to our transportation system. We didn't have enough money to repair our roads and bridges and keep up with the MBTA. And anything that we could use to address uh, any type of waste in the, uh, in the MBTA, we were addressing and trying to do, but we knew that it wasn't going to be enough. The governor came with a proposal and he said, we're going to increase taxes by $1.9 billion to our residents. We in the House said no to that. We in the House looked at what do we really need right now so that we can stop borrowing money to pay operating expenses so that we could run our transportation system more efficiently and less expensively. And what we really needed was a much smaller tax increase. Mr. Gerard, you've talked about the gas tax increase. So what happened was the governor wanted to increase our gas taxes by about nine cents. The House came back and said, no, we'll do three. I voted. To, for the lower amount because we needed something. So my choices were this, let our roads and bridges uh, fail, which was unacceptable to me, impose a tax on, uh, on uh, voters that I didn't think was necessary, that's unacceptable to me. So I went with the House version, which was the measured version. I get a call from the, from the governor at that time and his staff urging me, you know, telling me, you're Democrats, support me. And I said, no, it's not right for Burlington. It's not right for Bedford. It's not right for my district. So I supported the smaller tax increase. I voted for it. I voted for it. It, it took about three votes. Uh, same thing, and, uh, and, and that's what I did. Okay, thank you very much. And now, Mr. Gordon, you ask a question to Paul Gerard. Thank you very much. Mr. Gerard, um, I took a look at your online campaign finance disclosures, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you I'm a little concerned for our district. And here's why. I've tried very hard to make sure that I don't take more than either $500 from any organization or 1000 from any individual because that keeps me independent of any type of an influence. Nobody can threaten me. Nobody can say anything to me. They're not tied together. And so I could say, look it, I'm just not going to take the vote that you want. You don't own me. When I looked at your um, finances, one third of all of your support, either financial or otherwise, comes from one place. It's the Republican Town Committee in Marlboro. And the concern I have is that Marlboro competes with Burlington for economic development. We need the same high-tech businesses in, Mar in Burlington as they need in Marlboro, and sometimes we've lost business to Marlboro. One-third of your financing uh, in kind comes from one place, and it's our competitor. How do the voters of Burlington know that you'll be able to remain independent of Marlboro's influence if you take so much of your support from that town's Republican Town Committee? Well, Marble Republican Town Committee will not have any influence over me. They are trying to elect Republicans and to bring some balance and transparency on Beacon Hill. So they will actually have no, absolutely no influence over me in any way. They are drastically, they're trying to help elect Republicans, as you know. We have an unbalanced system. They'd like to, you know, one, one Republican elected helps on Beacon Hill. Every, every additional Republican will help. So they will actually have no influence over me whatsoever. And uh, I've, they've never asked, there's no strings attached, there is nothing. They are trying to help elect Republicans. And because my race was so close last time, they see it as a viable race to win, and they want to help elect Republicans and get some real representation on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Thank you. And now we move into closing statements. You have two minutes each. Mr. Gordon, you will begin. Folks, you just heard the difference between the two candidates for state representative. My opponent, Mr. Girard, just told you that a third of his support comes from a group that wants to elect Republicans. And his priority, therefore, is to the Republican Party and to Republicans. My priority is to you. My priority is to Burlington. I go to work every day with Republicans and with Democrats. I work with the business community and the residential community because my priority is Burlington. So what have I done? 
I've worked with uh, leadership in the House effectively to bring back benefits to Burlington, whether we're talking about the improvements to the intersection of Route 3 and 128, whether we're talking about the shuttle service that's going to come in from uh, Lowell and is already coming in from Cambridge to Burlington to help our businesses, whether we're talking about the forum that we had for seniors so that they could find a place to live once they find their homes are too big. And I've brought in the administration's undersecretary for uh, housing and community development, Crystal Cornegate. I brought her in from the governor's staff in a bipartisan way because I'm not about partisanship. I took this office four years ago and I promised myself I would do for this district what I want my state rep to do before I was ever involved in politics and that's stand up for this district and not worry about outside influences and so I have done just that. Folks, if you're concerned about a state rep who works for Burlington, you've got one choice in this race. I ask for your vote on November 8th. Thank you very much. Now Paul Gerard, your closing statement. Thank you for watching tonight. Um, I will absolutely be focused and concerned about the towns of this district, Burlington, Bedford, and Wilmington Precinct 3. If the voters choose to elect me, I will be absolutely focused on that. That will be my only focus. And you have to make a decision. The choice is yours. Are you interested in having a state representative who worked to help overturn the automatic gas tax, or do you want a state representative who voted six times during the budgeting process to give you an automatic gas tax? Are you interested in a state representative <coughs> who will stand up for the taxpayers or a state representative who received a 7% rating from Citizens for Limited Taxation? Are you interested in a state representative who will work to make sure that illegal immigrants are not getting public taxpayer benefits or a state representative who will allow more illegal immigrants into Massachusetts and thus taking our jobs and, and causing safety concerns? Are you interested in a state representative who will provide transparency and accountability on Beacon Hill or a state representative who will continue the status quo. I hope you will take a look at my website paulforstaterep.com and I ask for your vote on November 8th and I thank you for watching. Well thank you very much this was a uh, great and spirited uh, debate. In closing I'd like to thank the candidates Ken Gordon and Paul Gerard for sharing their vision and their views with the people of the 21st Middlesex District. Thank you, Joy Richard of the Burlington Union and the Bedford Minuteman, and Rich Hosford of B News. Finally, thank you to Jen Dodge and all of the uh, staff and volunteers at BCAT. You're the ones that make these types of events possible. And now, for those of you watching, remember, Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. Be sure to get out and vote. Take advantage of that right and responsibility. Thank you very much for watching.